Greetings. It's good to be with you this service. Come uh, by the internet to share a message from the Word of God. Hope you're well, and it's good to be meeting again in some way uh, in person, but many of you couldn't, so we're glad that you can join us this way too. Uh, I'd like you to, if you have a Bible that you can get to, uh, join me in the third epistle to John, John's epistle, the third uh, it's one of those, one of the five New Testament books that bear the name of the beloved Apostle John. Of course, the major one being the Gospel and then the Revelation. This is uh, one of the shorter ones, though, but a very uh, key message, too. And uh, I've been thinking about a concept that I recently heard about uh, through some reading that I had not been familiar with. It's... Uh, the sociology concept of human flourishing. And I wondered what that was and uh, how that would relate to our life as a believer. Maybe you would too. So join me in this uh, verse, verse two of, uh, I guess we'll read the first verse also, John's third epistle, verses one and two. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So he distinguishes, it seems, between uh, soul prosperity and just general prosperity. Maybe he equates that to physical or material prosperity. He doesn't specify. That word prosper is used uh, very uh, seldom in the New Testament. Uh, Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1 when he writes to the uh, people at Rome. He said, I hope to have a prosperous journey on my way to you. And then he says in uh, chapter 16 in his epistle, 1 Corinthians, he said, let every man lay by him in store as the Lord has prospered you on the first day of the week. Only those two or three instances do we have the word prosper. Uh, you hear some preaching today about prosperity and the prosperity gospel that God wants everybody to prosper physically and materially. And the implication, if not the direct teaching, is that if you're not prospering physically and materially, sin probably is in your life. Well, that certainly is not a concept that anybody's going to get from a study of the Bible. There is a passage in the Old Testament that uh, I think applies to the... Uh, Discussion, But first of all, let me, let me define what human prospering is or f human flourishing. It is practicing virtues and values such as integrity, dependability, a good work ethic. It's practicing virtues and values uh, that will eventually lead to happiness. The reward of living a life of virtues and values is happiness and human flourishing. Uh, you do this by uh, self-esteem uh, and self-direction mainly. That's the human, non-biblical concept of human flourishing. It occurs when you're doing what you ought to be doing and you're enjoying it also. Uh, and it's attaining happiness. So if you are out there in the world and you have achieved human flourishing, you are a member of society that... Uh, is a person who's doing the best you can. Uh, you're practicing just common virtues, well proven virtues of uh, integrity, honesty, dependability. And you're doing what you want to do and you're enjoying it. Uh, I think a good illustration of human flourishing in our current climax or day culture, uh, our first lady, Mrs. Crump, has initiated a campaign called Be Best, or Be Your Best, it's implied, but just, you'll see the words Be Best. Sometimes uh, she's, that's her signature, that's her campaign. Nothing wrong with that, she encourages young people to attain their full potential, to study hard, to work hard, to be, be the best person they can be. And uh, that certainly is uh, admirable. But there's something missing to uh, the human flourishing definition and concept, and that, of course, is uh, God's view of human flourishing or uh, flourishing, prospering. In Psalm 1, we read, 
the, day, the psalmist says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth, sitteth in the seat of the scornful. His delight is on the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's kind of a universal psalm. Uh, it's in the Old Testament. But I think it applies to people, godly people of all ages. If you meditate upon the word of God, if you are where you ought to be spiritually, uh, delighting, you, you're going to prosper. Maybe not uh, financially necessarily or materially or even physically all the time. Uh, the people of God of old, Old Testament people, descendants of Abraham specifically, uh, believed because they were descendants of Abraham that they would prosper materially. Abraham did. Many of the patriarchs did. Uh, they, they laid claim to the Abrahamic promise given in Genesis 12. First uh, couple, three verses, when God appeared to Abraham and said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. Uh, thou shalt be a blessing also. And I'm going to make your name great. Well, that was good as long as the person that claimed that promise, descendant of Abraham, was walking with God. Abraham didn't always, but he came back and reestablished an altar and, and uh, renewed his fellowship with God. God blessed him when he did. The nation of Israel uh, had some rough going as they went down into Abraham's descendants, went down into Egypt. Uh, and they prospered there for a while, but after Joseph and the Pharaoh, the new Joseph, passed from the sea, they, they were in bondage. They were in the wilderness 40 years and came out. And as they came out, God, um, before they went into the promised land, as they came out of the wilderness, God drew them together through their leader, uh, Moses, and, and made some really amazing statements. He said, now listen, listen, if you would follow my commandments, this is by the way in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you would observe to do all my commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set, on, set thee on high above all nations and all these blessings shall come on thee and over, overtake thee if thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall the fruit be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of sheep. Blessed shall your basket and thy store be. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee from before these seven ways, the Lord will command blessing upon thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand unto. He shall bless thee in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall bless, command blessings upon thee. Uh, and, uh, and just, he says in verse, nine, verse 10 of Deuteronomy, all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. So that was a strong, a very uh, wonderful set of promises. But by the way, in the next uh, few verses, he pronounces the curse that would be upon them if they chose not to walk in his ways. And they were just as strong and pronounced as were the blessings. So there's some precedent for a flourishing life, a prosperous life. Uh, and so, but I want to bring us to New Testament times. I said there's not much. We're, we uh, are not, most of us, descendants of Abraham, and God is not working uh, through the nation of Israel like he once did or like he once will again. He's, uh, he's calling people out from all nations of the earth to be members of the body of Christ, his church. So we go to the New Testament and... Uh, I want to just ask myself, and, and maybe you could inventory your own life. Am, am I living in such a way that, that God will bless me? 
And we've all known wonderful, wonderful godly people that have suffered. So we're not talking about material, physical, primarily spiritual blessings. In fact, we don't have to really debate that too long because Ephesians 1, 3, Paul says, we have been blessed. God is blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. So we have, we have spiritual blessings, but none of us want to set out to, to be just to get by. We want to, we want to be blessed in such a way that we uh, achieve some measure of success, that we, that we uh, impact other people in a good way, that we provide for our families the best we can, that we use opportunities available to us to glorify God. So my question to myself and to you today is, how can I do that? Um, and I give you just five simple steps. Uh, they are simple, but they are profound too. How can I be a blessing today? How can I prosper, as, as John said? I hope that you are prospering as your soul prospers. You are already receiving spiritual blessings and will forever because you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we have that soul prosperity. But he said, I hope that you prosper, even as your soul prospers. I hope you're doing well. And that's the desire for every pastor for his people. That's the desire for every father for his children, his household. And, and, and grandparents also pray almost every day, if not every day, for their grandchildren, that they will prosper, that they will achieve some measure of success, find a, a happiness grounded in the Lord, and... Um, be productive members of society. That's what we pray for. So number one, uh, I just want to encourage you, first of all, to make sure you have a right relationship with God. That's where it begins. Uh, the Apostle Paul was on his second missionary journey. He was waiting on Silas and Timothy to catch up with him. He was in the uh, megapolis of Athens, Greece. And it was a city given over to idolatry. In fact, that's what it says, that he was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. It moved him. It stirred him. He went to the synagogue several weeks and preached, or several days, and, and debated with them, these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who were given over just to hearing some new thing. Uh, they were trying to know themselves, as the ancient philosophers said, Socrates and and Plato, know thyself. So they were trying to know. They were seeking knowledge, but just knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And Paul met up with them in the Areopagus, and uh, he, went out to, uh, he went out to Mars Hill, and he addressed them. He said, you men of Athens, I perceive that you're too superstitious. <laughs> you're questioning and wondering about, and you have all these gods, these idols, um, to everything and under the sun. He said, I, as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar to, to this inscription, with this inscription, to the unknown God, even to the unknown God, in case you missed any with your idol. And Paul said, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So the apostle Paul said, I want to tell you about God, who he is, the real God, the true God. And he did that. Uh, he said, he's the God that created us and, and um, he's not worshipped with men's hands. And so know God, know the true God. There are false gods galore, but there's the true God, the God who made us all in his image so that we could know him and love him and serve him. And while you're searching for the true God, you will also find that you need to know his son, Jesus Christ. And when Jesus was here on earth, he uh, was always dialoguing with the Pharisees and scribes and, and others. And one day they came and said, what should we do that we might work the work of God? They'd seen his miracle, the feeding of 5,000 just shortly before that. He said, what can we do that we could do to work the work of God? They wanted to maybe have the ability to do what he was doing, great miracles. And uh, Jesus said, this is the work of God. This is in John chapter 6, verse 29. This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. You want to work the work of God? It starts with believing. 
believing. And then, then in the discourse that followed, uh, Jesus said several things. Let me just read a few of them. He said in verse 36, I said unto you that you also have seen me and you believe not. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of which, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Uh, verse 45, it is written in the prophets, they shall, they shall see they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me, Jesus said. Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So did you get, catch there that the word believe continues, uh, uh, is reiterated several times from the lips of Jesus. It, it, it all hinges upon whom do you believe? And what, what do you believe? You want to have a, a right relationship with God? You, you, you cannot do it without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 7, verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So again, uh, it's so important. If, you're, if you want to know God, and this is a way to find fulfillment, uh, you need to you need to believe. You need to believe on Jesus. One more verse, chapter 5 of John. You have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him, ye believe not. It, that's the crucial question today. Do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe he's the bread of heaven that came down? Uh, and the water of life that we need to partake of spiritually. And to believe in, just to believe in. But he is sin of God. So number one, believe. Establish a relationship with God. Secondly, educate yourself as to why you're here. Uh, the ancient philosophers, I said, they said, know yourself. Well, we need to educate ourselves as Bible-believing people, as Christians, as Christ ones. We need to educate, educate ourselves as, why am, why am I here? And I think that, uh, again, you will come to the conclusion as Jesus did in John 6.38, I think I read it, but let me read it again. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. A little bit later when he prayed that great uh, upper room prayer, he said, Father, I have finished the work which you sent me to do. I've done your will. So our goal as believers is to do God's will. And our goal as believers is to live in such a way that would please him. As you contemplate what that would be, let me just give you a, a guiding principle. Uh, it's one that I've been driven to time and time again, and I never tire of thinking about it or reiterating it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Twenty-four elders bow down before the throne of God, and this is their, the, the, uh, the word they echo, or they, they say, Lord, you alone are worthy. Now listen. For thou, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So we were created for God's pleasure, and through our obedience and love and devotion to him, he receives glory and power and honor. We need to educate ourselves as to why we are here. Are you here? Do you realize you're here? If you know God and believe on his son, you're here to glorify him. Uh, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says that's the job of, the, of every one of us who are in the church to bring glory to him, world without end. Thirdly, we need to engage in, advance, in advancing God's kingdom. We do that by being, being equipped. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, we're all members of the body of Christ. Pastor Joel has preached on this uh, often occasionally and it bears repeating all the time because we need to remind ourselves we are members of his body and then Paul says in the same verse uh, we're, we're part of the body of Christ we're all members and we are members in particular uh, so need to get that down in our, our minds I think I misquoted that so I'm going to go read it to you so that I can get it as he said it, um, 
You are the body of Christ. First Corinthians 12, 20. You are the body of Christ, being the church at Corinth. And individual. But he said also, and members in particular. So we are members, each one of us, members of the body of Christ. Uh, and God is building this body, this church. He does so by gifting people. Early church, it was apostles. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 11 Prophets were part of that early church uh, building process. And then, and then evangelists and then pastors and teachers. And you probably may say, oh, I'm not any one of those. Well, he, he gave some gifts, it says in verse uh, 8 of this chapter, chapter 4 of Ephesians. He gave gifts un, unto men. He gave gifts unto men. In Romans 12, we read a, <coughs> a list, <coughs> excuse me, a list of some of those gifts. The gift of teaching, the gift of giving, the gift of administration, uh, the gift of mercy. And Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 4.10. He said, uh, as everyone has received the gift. Actually, the word, the definite article does not occur in the original language. It, it would read this way. As everyone or everyone else has received a gift, a gift. We've received, all of us have. So we have been equipped uh, to edify the body, Ephesians 4, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, uh, and for evangelizing. That's the commandment he gave us. Go and teach all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Last command uh, before he ascended to heaven. So we need to engage after we know him and have believed in Jesus and have determined we're here to, to glorify him uh, and bring glory to his name, then we need to be equipped, uh, and then we need to use those gifts that he gives us, that he equips us with to serve him. Number four, we need to, be, we need to employ right values. What do I mean by that? Well, we need in our hearts to value spiritual realities over physical Physical things are going to pass with time. Uh, we, need, we need to elevate eternal over temporal. Uh, we need to take a look around us and see where our value system is. Do we put most of our time and effort and monies into that which is temporal or physical, that which is going to pass? Or do we value most highly that which is going to never perish with the passing of time? Uh, we need to have people over possessions. Nothing wrong with having possessions, but we need to value people. People, living souls over any possession. We need to elevate purpose over pleasure. What are we doing? Is this, uh, is this compatible, compatible with our purpose for being here? Or are we just living for the next pleasure, the next high, the next thrill, the next experience that we've not experienced before. So have, have the right, uh, we need to have the right uh, values. And then finally, number five, if you're keeping track, we need to, we need to uh, elevate godly virtues in our life. Virtues such as faith. That's where it begins. And then Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, knowledge and temperance and patience and... Uh, <laughs> things like uh, things that uh, are uh, kindness and charity, things that God would have us to elevate, virtues, pure thoughts, uh, healthy habits, genuine character, genuine character, Christ-like character, uh, universal principles such as love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor yourself. And uh, those are the things that we need to uh, elevate. So let me just review again. We need to uh, make sure that we are, that we have an established, we have established a right relationship with God. That we have educated ourselves why we're here. That we are employing right values. That we are elevating godly virtues in our life. And uh, those things, I think, are important. Uh, 
a couple of young people that grew up in our church uh, came from different kinds of homes. They both grew up within the shadow, so to speak, of Thompson Robeb's church. Uh, they have both now served on mission fields in various parts of the world for more than a quarter of a century with their spouses and families. But one of them grew up in a pretty typical middle-class neighborhood, Beach Grove, actually. Uh, but when he was a young man, uh, somebody in this church invited him to come service as he came, heard the gospel. He had been in a liberal church, heard the gospel, got saved, surrendered to God's service, and and uh, has served him since, prepared and went to the mission field. Another, another young person grew up in a, a not a, a solid middle class home. Uh, she was kind of a, a loner because she, somebody invited her to Sunday school and picked her up on the bus and she came and loved it and stayed in church uh, all of her school days. Uh, went to a Christian college, met and married a young man that was going to be a missionary, and they've served the Lord faithfully. I'm not going to mention the name. Some of you are longtime teachers probably know who I'm talking about, but this gal uh, bucked the toughest of circumstances uh, growing up. She had no encouragement. Nobody was going to pay her way to Christian school or college. Some of you who are listening, some of the people that are now gone have hel- did help her. And she, uh, by the grace of God, flourished, as did the other gentlemen. They both flourished. Uh, They're serving the Lord. They're producing fruit. They are soul winning. I got a call just a few days ago this week uh, from a young man who similarly uh, was directed to our church by another adult Christian who lived on another side of town. And he couldn't bring this young man to his church. So he said, I know a church close to where you live. And he directed him to Thompson Road. He found a ride to church on a bus. His circumstances were even more difficult than the other, than the other missionary I mentioned. His, uh, he, uh, his mother died when he was 13. Uh, his dad made bad decisions in coping her with, with her death and uh, became pretty much an alcoholic. And by the way, this is I'm using this. This I'm not going to use his name, but I've got his permission to share his testimony because he called and said, uh, "I'm very sick. He's at a local hospital. Uh, I don't know that he's going to make it through. He may, by the grace of God, but he wanted to just say. Uh, and by the way, he, he he did the best he could because again, uh, people, teachers, workers, bus workers, put their arms around him, uh, drew him by cords of love to. Christ and to walk with him. And he did when he was a teenager, became a bus worker. Uh, and so he, he married a, a Christian lady. They have three children. He's buying a home. This is what he shared with me. Those things would have been unheard of, uh, undreamed of by this young man when he was 15 years of age. But by the grace of God, he's lived I think in a flourishing life, not that he has anything material that most of you would desire. He, he's buying a house, but I'm sure it's very modest and he's, he's struggled. His health has been a problem, but he has the peace of God in his heart. And he called just to pretty much thank you. And uh, those of you who prayed for him and loved him. Uh, for helping him flourish in life. So there's all kinds of levels of uh, flourishing. Uh, If you are a godly person, you'll be like the tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit. Uh, Some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold, but we can flourish. And so it's my heart's desire for you, if you're listening, that you will flourish, that you will, as John said to Uh, Gaius, when he wrote the third epistle, he says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. I wish you well. Uh, Sometimes I sign cards, I send, wishing you all the best. Well, sometimes I say all of his best, because that's what all the best is, all of his best. I hope that you prosper.
Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us revelation that tells us how we can flourish. And we understand that prosperity today doesn't mean having a bank account that won't stop or several vehicles or the latest gadgets, but it just means being right with you. It means being engaged in advancing your kingdom. Uh, it means um, living with a right value system. And uh, so I pray that if there's somebody listening to this message just, just right now, that they might say, uh, I know God. I believed in Jesus. But what lack I yet? What lack I yet? May they find what it is in their life that you want to fill that void with. Maybe it's a surrender for service. Maybe they need to reevaluate their value system. And whatever it is, Lord, speak to each heart today and minister as you, your Holy Spirit would. Thank you for this opportunity to share these words in Jesus' name. Amen.